Okay, we'll get this meeting started. My name is Steve Train. I'm the chair of the American Lobster Management Board. And apparently we've got a bigger audience now than some of the other meetings earlier today because they'll be able to listen to our podcast now that the parade is over and they've been able to go home. Uh, I'm assuming everybody had the paperwork, has had a copy, had it emailed to them. Uh, by consent, can we get an approval of the agenda? Anyone opposed? Okay, agenda is approved. Is there anyone opposed to approving the proceedings of the previous meeting from October? If not, I'll consider that approved by consent. Okay, seeing none. This is our public comment period. I only have three people currently signed up for public comment. I need to remind you public comment is for something that is not on the agenda. So if you'd like to come up to speak, currently I have, I gotta try to read these names. Gib Brogan. Gib Brogan is first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Gib Brogan. I'm with Oceana. Uh, we've been following the Commission's work on the Lobster FMP and looking at the addendum process and following the TRT and the biological opinion processes. And looking at these, I, th I think that as you discuss this today and look at the, the issues that are facing the lobster fishery with right whales and other large whales, I think it's important that the Commission come away with, from today's meeting with some clarity on the interaction between these processes. Right now there's the take production team, take production plan that's working on their work, there's a biological opinion that's ongoing, and there's potentially an addendum. And the interplay between these three moving pieces is really important. And having clarity on what these mean, how these are going to proceed in the coming months will be very important to get a good outcome for this fishery. So we hope that coming out of today we have a, a clear idea of what's happening there. An overarching issue with this addendum as we see it is the need for a clear statement of a purpose and need for this action. The various documents that are out there right now, the, the working group's work that, that has been done through their meetings and the documents that are available right now make some passing reference to why this addendum is happening. And strong fisheries management, strong outcomes come out of clear purpose and need. And so another suggestion that we have for this meeting today is to come up with a clear statement of why you're doing this addendum. If you don't mind, that you're speaking on an agenda item now. I'm sorry, I was, I was looking at things that weren't in the available documents related to the addendum. I apologize. Thank you very much. Jane Davenport, you are next. No, not yet. Thank you. My name is Jane Davenport, and I'm with um, Defenders of Wildlife. And I and some of my other colleagues are members of the TRT representing the conservation community. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly aware that this public comment opportunity is not meant to be on agenda items, but I'd also um, like to ask that you indulge, you know, as per the statement in the um, meeting overview, that there be limited opportunity for comment on agenda items that the public has not had opportunity for comment on. So if I may, I'd just like to make a brief comment where the public on that because we haven't had that opportunity before. Brief. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, we're certainly encouraged that um, the Commission is being proactive in putting together this um, American Lobster and Whale work group to move forward with an addendum to try to solve the problem. Um, the environmental NGOs that I work with are, have been very skeptical of whether effort reduction is going to get this fishery where it needs to go and enable the National Marine Fishery Service to get where it needs to go 
um, in respect to complying with the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So while we are very encouraged that the addendum is speaking in terms of reducing vertical line rules, we want to encourage the Commission and its work to be really clear on the data that's being used um, about the, the effort and the locations of various fisheries to really prove that whatever uh, vertical line reduction measures are being considered and eventually passed in an addendum will truly be effective at reducing the risk to uh, North Atlantic right whales and other large whales from vertical lines in the water column. If you don't mind, you may want to make this comment at, after uh, we get to the next agenda item when we're actually discussing the addendum. Will there be an opportunity for public comment then? I will make an opportunity. Thank then. you. That would be very much appreciated. And we have Percy Bennett Nickerson. Did I say the first name right? Hello, Percy Bennett Nickerson, and I work for the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, and my comments are sort of a mixed bag as to whether or not it's about this agenda item or about Addendum 26. Um, we commented on Addendum 26 um, when it was uh, in, in the scoping phase, and we'd like to reiterate some of those comments now. We are encouraged that in this particular action, the board is recommending that VTR and VMS or something sim uh, along, along those lines would be implemented within one year. That would be in line with our comments on Addendum 26. I haven't heard or we haven't heard any updates on where that is in, in the process and it's I'm guessing that it's possible that some of the actions that are done by this board would change some of the outcomes of that. I'm not 100% sure, just hoping that we can get an update on that. But specifically, our, rec our um, requests and recommendations would be that there would be a 100% catch reporting requirement at the trip level for all permit holders, that there require additional reporting requirements including a lost gear reporting requirement require harvesters to report all data, including fishing locations by 10 minute squares or a finer spatial, spatial scale if available, require harvesters to report all data electronically, Requ require electronic monitoring, require regional specific gear markings at least every 40 feet of line, and implement trip caps and ownership limits in the lobster fishery to eliminate latent trip allocation and reduce any number of traps that are actually fished. Um, so I don't know whether that's related to 26 or to what's happening now, but sort of a mixed bag. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody who has not signed up for public comment that would like to speak? Our next agenda item is the report from the Lobster Whale work, Working Group. Megan's going to give that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm giving the report on the recommendations from the Lobster Whale Work Group. Just as a reminder, at annual meeting, the board reviewed ongoing discussions related to white, right whale conservation and fisheries management. Um, and that included a review of the technical memo by the Science Center on factors contributing to right whale population declines, as well as the recent discussions of the take reduction team. Given the potential for impacts to the lobster fishery, the board created this work group to discuss the measures being considered and provide recommendations to the board. And work group members included uh, state agency staff, including some of the commissioners on the lobster board, federal partners, and ASMFC staff. So before going into the discussion of the work group, I wanted to provide an overview of the ongoing processes related to right whale conservation, because I think it's important context for the work group's discussion. So as you all know, Atlantic right whale populations have been in decline since 2010. And as a result, there are kind of two processes that are ongoing. The first is under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and that is the work of the take reduction team. And that team is charged with reducing serious injury and mortality of right whales. Um, at their upcoming spring meeting, they are expected to finalize recommendations to NIMS. Um, at this point, I think it's unclear what that take reduction team will recommend, but certainly some of the, some of the discussions have included season closures, ropeless testing, weak rope, and gear markings. Um, we also have, under the Endangered Species Act, the preparation of the biological opinion. 
and a biological opinion provides a determination of jeopardy. And I wanted to provide that definition of jeopardy to the board. It is when an action is reasonably expected to, directly or indirectly, diminish a species' numbers, reproduction, or distribution so that the likelihood of survival and recovery is appreciably reduced. And I've kind of underlined some of the important statements for both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act to show that that definition of jeopardy is a bit broader than what the take reduction team discusses. So just a little bit more on the biological opinion. Again, it provides a conclusion on whether an action is likely to jeopardize the continued existence of an ESA species. And again, that definition of jeopardy is broader, so it includes things like their reproduction, their distribution. The biological opinion consults on fisheries as they're currently operating or as modified by rulemaking. So that can include things like the TRT recommendations and subsequent rulemaking, um, but it also can include commission action. So it means that actions taken by this lobster board can be taken into account in a biological opinion. If there is a jeopardy finding, so that is one of the potential results of a biological opinion, it results in reasonable and prudent alternatives, and those alternatives must relieve jeopardy. Uh, those come as a component of the biological opinion, and those alternatives are developed outside of the typical commission process. So with that background information, um, the work group did note the several ongoing processes associated with right whale conservation, which could substantially impact the economic and cultural future of the lobster fishery. Given the high economic value of the lobster fishery and its social significance, the work group agreed that it is important to ensure that the implementation of right whale, right whale conservation measures takes place in ways that maintains the viability of the lobster fishery. So you all know, you're, as members of the commission, that commission is the managing authority for the lobster FMP. And some of the goals of the FMP include promoting economic efficiency, maintaining opportunities for participation, preserving cultural features of the industry. And given this, the work group concluded that action by the board to consider modifications to measures in the lobster FMP is warranted at this time. By the commission taking action, states can continue to cooperatively participate in the management of the species. And in addition, those who are most familiar with lobster management and the fishery can provide input on those future regulations. The work group did recognize that other regulatory changes may occur in the fishery, but noted the need to proactively respond to these growing challenges that are facing the lobster fishery. So the recommendation from the work group is that this board initiate an addendum to consider reducing the number of traps and or vertical lines in the water and require vessel tracking systems for federal permit holders. And there were four components of that recommendation which I will go through, but it was also included in your supplemental meeting materials. So part one, um, management tools that the plan development team should evaluate are reductions of vertical lines using trap limits, gear configurations, seasonal closures, and or other measures to achieve a rate of 20% and 40% by LCMA, exclusive of LCMA 6. Um, there was a note that trap reduction should consider ongoing state and federal management actions by LCMA, as well as future trap reductions that are already set in rule. There was also a recommendation that the PDT evaluate the elimination of the 10% replacement trap tag provision. So right now, some states issue additional 10% annual allotments um, automatically, while other states issue this when it's requested. And so there's a potential for some fishermen to fish above what is their trap limit. There was also a recommendation that the plan development team evaluate the acceleration of planned trap reductions. Number two was vessel tracking, so a vessel tracking system that would be required for federal lobster permit holders, um, and that this be an advanced monitoring or tracking system. So it not only track the movement, but also identify where gear is hauled or how many traps are fished. Number three was reporting. The PDT should develop a method for reporting vertical line and trap use by individual in each jurisdiction until 100% harvester reporting is implemented in state and federal waters. 
And number four, um, in addition, the plan development team may want to consider the list of management tools below if they're not included in the final take reduction team recommendations. And that included weak, weak link placement on rope, under, other innovations to break rope, and reduced rope strength on one or both ends. And kind of the whole compilation of those recommendations, again, is, recommend, is included in your supplemental materials. And with that, I will take any questions. We have questions for Megan. Wow, you crushed it. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Megan, for that um, for that summary. Um, a lot of work, a lot of conversations have gone into the, to this uh, to try to make determinations how and if the commission should should be involved. Um, I, I know many people around this table have a lot of concerns um, about the commission taking actions as it re as it regards to the protection of whales. However. Um, I, I think we need to. I think we need to act. Um, I think the goals stated within the working paper, as far as what the FMP should include, including promoting economic efficiency and maintaining opportunities for, for participation, as well as preserving the cultural fe features of the industry, are important to to, rec to recognize. Um, I, I frankly, with with due respect to my friends at NOAA, don't want NOAA making decisions on what this lobster fishery should look like in the future. So I'm not sure what the process should be yet and how we should begin uh, developing uh, a motion, but I do believe that we, we need to take action. Um, there were several comments uh, from the public in regards to Kind of cr having a clear direction from the commission uh, and the commission process, and and I think that is imperative that we understand what our role is versus the TRT. In in my mind, and and that people can can correct me if they feel differently. In my mind, the TRT is dealing with serious injury and mortality uh, associated with right whales, and our role as a board should be. How can we as a board and as a management body and as juris individual jurisdictions reduce risk to the right whales? So to me, this is risk associated with the biological opinion, uh, as, as Megan stated earlier. So I, I want to make sure that we don't start doing TRT work here. And um, I'm, I'm working on a motion uh, in my mind dealing with the electronic monitoring part to try to separate that, but I'll, I'll reserve, uh, ask to reserve some time for later so I can uh, think about what that should be. But with that, I'll stop rambling. Thank you, Pat. David Borden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a member of the working group, I just thought I'd comment from the perspective of I have a lot of personal reservations uh, about the motion. Uh, and uh, I think, as everyone knows, uh, I represent the offshore lobster industry. Um, and um, so I, I have a lot of reservations about what the motion says, how it says it, what the process is that, that uh, uh, would be followed and where we'll end up uh, in in the final analysis. But having said that and having those um, uh, concerns about the motion, I think Pat's comment is dead on that the, if we if we want to control our own future on this, uh, I would point out we have to get ahead of the issue instead of responding to the issue. Uh, and and that carries a lot of uncertainty because our normal way of doing business is we ask a bunch of technical people to say, how much of a cut do we need? How uh, uh, how much of a restriction uh, should we put uh, on our industry? And they come back with a number and then we work on it. And that's all a fairly logical process. That process is not being followed. We're not going to know what the cut is until the end when the agency basically comes out with its jeopardy finding. So what, what we do here uh, is a step, and then what I, I, regardless of what we do, it, it's a step in the right direction. 
Uh, and then the TRT process is basically going to follow on and take additional action on the issue. And then when NOAA do makes its determination, uh, if, if it requires additional action, then there's going to be additional action that the agency is going to take. So this is a, it's kind of a hybrid, uh, but I emphasize the fact that every jurisdiction around this table has fixed gear fishermen. Uh, and, and the primary f focus of this motion is on, on the lobster fishery, but in the final analysis, every one of the fixed gear fisheries may be affected by this, this issue. So in my view, where I come down on this, although there's uncertainty, although I have res personal reservations, I support moving forward, and I've got a motion that Megan has uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any other questions? John Clark, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted a clarification on this first recommendation. It says to achieve a rate of 20 and 40 percent by each LCMA. What does that mean? It's just the range of reductions that would be in the addendum. So it should be 20 to 40 percent? I think the idea was that the two options would be 20 and 40 percent, but the the range oh. in between is is still okay because it's within the range of options in the document. I'm looking for other hands that want to comment. Not seeing any. David, did you say you had a motion, David Borden? Yeah, Megan. Megan has it, or you've got it, Megan. I'll read it. Uh-oh, she added 10,000 words to it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> this, this I would point out before I even open my, my mouth, I have to get my glasses out. And number one, and number two, I would point out, this is what the New England Council calls a Dr. Pierce motion. Oh, now, now. <laughs> All right, so I would move to initiate an addendum to reduce the number of vertical lines in the water and require vessel tracking systems for federal permit holders. PDT should consider the following as specified in the Lobster Whale Work Group memo. PDT may need to consider the ongoing activities of the Altorp uh, when drafting the document. The first bullet, uh, reduction of vertical lines by 20 to 40 percent for each LCMA, exclusive of uh, Area 6. Percent reductions by LCMA may differ given the ongoing and future uh, trap reductions as well as newly proposed or implemented area closures in state and federal waters. Next bullet in LCMA 1 for Five in the Outer Cape, reductions can be achieved by trap limits, gear configurations, season closures, or other measures. Next bullet in LCMA, two and three reductions can be achieved by gear configurations, seasonal closures, acceleration of current or planned trap reductions, or other measures. Next bullet, elimination of the 10% uh, replacement trap, uh, trap tag provision, next bullet, requiring 10% of federal lobster permit holders to have advanced, 100%, uh, excuse me, 100% of federal uh, lobster permit holders to have advanced vessel monitoring and tra slash tracking systems that could not only track movement but also identify where gear is hauled or how many traps are fished. Last bullet, developing a method for reporting vertical lines and traps used by individuals in each jurisdiction until 100% harvester reporting is implemented uh, in state and federal waters. So I move that, Mr. Chairman. Take a breath, David. Do we have a second? Doug Grout, second. David, would you like to speak to motion? Yeah, I, I already made my point, but I would note for the record that's the longest motion I've ever made in my life. Doug, as a seconder, would you like a chance to speak? Doug Rout. Yes, I almost wasn't going to second it because it does violate the Pierce rule because they did shrink the fonts up there, and that's not <laughs> to get it on one page. <laughs> but I decided to 
moving forward. I, I agree that, um, you know, the main purpose of this, at least from my standpoint, is that uh, the commission and the industry have some input into trying to avoid what measures uh, to try and avoid a jeopardy finding. I would hope that somewhere in our process our federal partners might give us an indication of what the, the percentage cuts that we might have to take here uh, to avoid a jeopardy finding. Uh, it makes uh, our decisions a lot easier instead of just guessing. Um, but I think it's important we start today uh, and take a look at this and try and come up with some, uh, with this kind of an outline, some uh, options, and uh, uh, also we also need to come up with a good problem statement too. Thank you, Doug. Any other comments on the motion? Questions? Pat Kelleher. Mr. Chairman, if I could direct this question through you to the maker of the motion. Um, David, the requiring 100% of federal lobster permit holders, um, I get it. Um, I understand why we need to do it. Um, but I'm going to go back to the comment that I made earlier in regards to kind of a clear line between what the commission is going to be doing and what the TRT is going to be doing. To me, that gets to the issues around serious injury and mortality and monitoring those issues. And do you think that that would be better dealt with separately by um, a recommendation from this board to the agency um, to address through the TRT process? Go ahead, David. Yeah, um, Pat, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking because, I mean, we, we already have a number, of, the commission already has a number of requests on that, on, on the reporting issue in, in the system. So are you suggesting something other than those uh, items? If you are, please be a little bit clearer, more explicit. No, Thank just you. just the second to the last bullet, David. Just very, making it, instead of making it a part of this motion, I, I, I guess we can't remand anything to the TRT, but if we could, um, to me, this seems like an issue better dealt with by the TRT, and it is something that uh, the agency could put into place much quicker through their rulemaking under MMA versus going through uh, this process and then advancing it to, to the agency. David? Yeah. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I guess my answer is I'm not sure of how fast the rules are going to get implemented. If we were to <clears throat> adopt a whole series of provisions that are consistent with the motion, um, my assumption is we wouldn't do it until uh, summer, Megan. Is that the timeline we're on or fall? In, what, terms, in terms of when you would see a document for public comment or final action? The... the um, the comment? Um, I think some of that will depend, honestly, on um, the ongoings of the take reduction team and um, monitoring what they're doing with that group. So I think it would be either May or August board meeting. Yeah. So I, I guess going back to Pat's question, if, if, you, if we were to pull that out and, and we could, for instance, make that a recommendation that the commission submits to the TRT and asks them to consider it if, uh, and I would have no objection to that. Go ahead, Pat, and then we need to get to some other people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's where I'm going, David. I'm, I'm just wondering, we have a lot of work to do, well, or we, the PDT, st our staff has a lot of work to do between now and May uh, if this motion passes. And I'm just trying to figure out if there are ways to streamline the work. And I know um, that the TRT uh, did have some preliminary discussions in regards to this, and maybe it's best left there uh, for now. Yeah, I'd, I'd ask Mr. Chairman whether or not um, Mr. Grout has any objections to removing that bullet uh, from the motion and then taking it up subsequently. In I have no objection with uh, that uh, that that process. 
So, Steve, I think you have a perfected motion. Okay, now I'm wondering, do we need to read what we're removing because the motion has changed, Bob? Steve, we'll need to reread it into the record when it gets time to vote on it. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> we'll let Dave do that. Uh, Dan McKernan, you were next. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm concerned about one aspect of the motion when it talks specifically about percent reductions by LCMA um, may differ given ongoing and future trap reductions because in Massachusetts portion of Outer Cape and Area 2, um, we have a documented decline in vertical lines over the last seven years. We instituted a mandatory reporting um, form to all of our fishermen at the end of the year to ask them, how many vertical lines are you fishing? And I was challenged by the industry saying, why are you asking this? And I said, because you're going to get credit when your vertical lines go down. And so I, I, I guess it's implied um, what the starting point is, but I just, I, I guess I'm forecasting to you all now that we're not going to tolerate um, a, a lack of recognition of reductions in, in vertical lines that have taken place, including those that aren't being brought about by trap reductions, by simply changing fishing uh, strategies. Some of the Outer Cape fishermen are, are going from 800 single traps to uh, 800 traps fished as 20 pot trawls, and that's going to have, you know, a huge uh, decline in the number of vertical lines. And so we 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 need not apply these formulas to each LMA the same. <clears throat> and because Massachusetts instituted this very unique reporting form, that puts us. Uh, you could either say in the catbird seat or on the firing line. And so I'm just letting you, you all know that this is really going to be important to us that uh, we not start this, this, um, this process or this, this reference point of either last year or the year before because right whales started to go downhill a decade ago and, and the, the fishermen in those two areas have, have suffered a lot of uh, trap cuts but also documented reductions in vertical lines. Thank you, Dan. Sarah Peake. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I share the uh, concerns of our Deputy Director, and my questions were going to be targeted in the same way, so I won't take up the group's time to just restate what was just uh, stated by him. I will take a moment of personal privilege to come to the defense of our Director of uh, DMF that uh, sometimes details matter and facts matter, and I appreciate his detailed approach, so thank you. And the gentleman to my right as well. Thank you. Uh, Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask the service, I guess, Peter, um, the difference between um, having the, uh, the VMS language uh, go into this document as opposed to us separately writing a letter to the service asking them to implement it, if, if there's any difference in the, in the timing or how they would view that. Peter, you were next on my checklist anyway. Peter Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I was, uh, I was, my comment was going to be related to, uh, to the same question that Richie had. I think that um, certainly we understand that there's, there's two memos in the file right now that have recommendations for um, VMS for all federal vessels. And I know that in Addendum 26 we had a pilot program that was, a, that was approved that would look at um, VMS um, across the different types of vessels in different areas in, in, uh, in the offshore fishery. And so um, my thinking was that it would be a more of a um, sort of a collaborative approach um, at the lobster board level we, using a working group or this pilot program to, to really try to ground truth what the best way to, to implement VMS would be. Um, I don't know if we've moved forward at all with, with that working group or not, but certainly if there's something that moves forward in that direction, we would want to be informed by that. Um, in the meantime, I think that for the purposes of this motion, I mean, I think we could go either way. I think if it's included in here, I don't think it hurts. Um, 
I like the fact that it is included in here because I think um, with our law enforcement committee, um, with the state and industry people that are on the lobster board, um, that we could probably have a more informed conversation about how to best implement VMS. Um, you know, if you, if you, the alternative, I guess, would be to write a letter to us and ask us to implement 100% mandatory VMS for all federal lobster vessels, but that leaves a lot to uh, the service to try to understand the best way to do that, and I think that um, we would be better served and the industry would be better served by having the input of the board. So um, I don't know if I'm being very definitive one way or the other, but I, th um, I don't think it hurts having it in here, and I'm not sure if having it go to the TRT for consideration would necessarily be the best way for us to move forward with a um, with uh, the right information to be able to decide how to how to do that. Thank you, Peter. Richie, you satisfied? Okay, David Borden again. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as far as the uh, motion itself, uh, the reason I withdrew that, I wanted to have a separate discussion on it. So my view is that would follow. Uh, we'd, we'd put that. So uh, I'm not going to go back and answer all of Peter's questions in the uh, interest of, of time. So uh, I'd like to go back to the, the point that Dan made. Um, I, have, I have exactly the same when I was attempting to be brief when I talked about my reservations, uh, and I'm going to still be brief, but I have all the same reservations he has uh, on the, this issue of the percent reductions. If you look at the, the um, allocations, area four and five, these are the mid-Atlantic um, lobster management areas, areas three and two in the Outer Cape have all had very extensive uh, trap allocation um, programs that were based on history that eliminated and have subsequently consolidated the industry in a lot of those areas. And that um, that sentence, that second sentence, is, is designed to basically uh, say to those areas that uh, your efforts in the past are going to be recognized as part of this, uh, part of the process. So I agree with what uh, Dan said, and I think we have to just recognize that uh, vertical line cuts in the areas are going to be different in different areas depending upon the density uh, of, the, of the traps and how they relate to a whole host of variables like exempted areas. They're going to be uh, exempted areas uh, where uh, we may have different, a different set of rules. So um, that's what the intent of that sentence is. Thank you. Thank you, David. I haven't seen any more hands, so this is where I'm going to go back to the public and see if there's any comment on the addendum. Please step up. Oh, Peter Burns, and then I'll go to the public. When the public comes up, please come up and say your name at the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to jump in, um, but I, um, I just think it's important after David's comment. Um, first of all, I, I I'm pleased with, with the motion, and I'm, I'm pleased that there's some, uh, some interest uh, on behalf of the board here to move forward. I think it's really important, and I think that um, timing is of the essence here. I think that as soon as uh, the commission can start to develop this addenda, I think that is really going to be a, a great way so that we can try to complement whatever comes out of the TRT to try to avoid a jeopardy finding with a biological opinion. And I think now is the time to start doing that. It's a lot of work moving forward, but I think we're heading in the right direction here, and at least we have something uh, in the pipeline now. Um, I just, as far as um, the fine print in the motion, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, to. To understand really where the ESA is coming from, I'm not really sure um, how anything in the past may or may not be able to be credited. And I don't want to put the cart before the horse here because I, um, you know, I, I think everything should go on the table and, and we should have some clear expectations on how we want to move forward. But um, I, I think that depending on, I think the ESA and the biological opinion are going to be looking at the best available information. Um, and we've seen reductions in, uh, in the population of whales going down since 2010. Um, I think that the ESA and the bi biological opinion we're going to want to look at the most um, recent information available to to base the reductions on. I think that there's some that uh, clearly could be some credit for the uh, area three trap caps that NIMS hasn't implemented yet that um, that we're looking at, um, and there's also some area two 
uh, trap reductions that have not um, come to pass yet, but that are that are on the books. So that could certainly happen. And so I'm not saying that definitively we couldn't get credit for something in the past, but I'm just trying to um, let folks know that the ESA and the biological opinion may have a different way of calculating these reductions moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now, once again, back to the public. If you'd like to speak, please state your name when you come up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity. I am Jane Davenport with Defenders of Wildlife. And before the Commission votes, I'd really like to urge you to consider a larger range of reduction than the 20 to 40 percent that's currently on the table. My understanding from the October Working Group meeting is that at that point, the range of alternatives included up to 50 percent reduction. But um, amplifying what Peter Burns just said, it's critical to understand that as the uh, um, agency's tech memo demonstrated in the fall, a female right whale has only a 5% chance of avoiding an a entanglement in a vertical line in the 10-year calving interval. And of course, that 10-year interval is because of chronic entanglements in fishing lines. The normal calving interval for a right whale is three to four years. So as a matter of biology, not as a matter of what the agency has found in a biological opinion, but as a matter of what the best available scientific data has shown, entanglements are already causing jeopardy to the North Atlantic right whale in terms of both lethal and the sublethal effects of affecting reproduction. So, you know, I commend your commission for being proactive on this, but please understand that this is a time for bold action, not conservative action, and considering a larger percentage reduction, considering more innovative methods of getting rid of end lines, such as, for example, having um, a ropeless mechanism on one end and a rope on the other, that would achieve a 50 percent reduction right there. Understanding that that technology is not ready to come off the shelf yet, the Commission could play a really important role in facilitating and incentivizing the development of those technologies. So again, I just respectfully ask that you consider even bolder action than what you've got in the motion before the Commission. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else in the public? Come up, state your name, please. Uh, good afternoon, Patrice McCarran with the Maine Lobstermen's Association. Um, I want to thank the Commission for forming this group and putting this motion forward. The Maine Lobstermen's Association does support the motion. Um, this is really tough business for the lobster industry. I don't think our association or our industry um, exactly shares Ms. Davenport's view of our role in the entanglement, but we do acknowledge that we, we play a role and our fishery needs to change. Um, this biological opinion is scary, and when I think about the courts deciding things or the service deciding things, I know that they don't understand the fishery and they don't adequately understand how these actions might affect our livelihoods and our ability to continue to make a living. Um, I think the Commission is uniquely qualified to do this work. I think the close involvement of the states who understand the fishery, you know, I, I certainly hear Mr. McCannon's um, concerns. These fisheries are diverse. You know, you think vertical line reduction, 50 percent, no problem. But you start to talk this through with guys, and you guys who fish singles, you guys have guys who fish pairs up to 20 trap trawls. And it's quickly a mess. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's probably multiple approaches that would allow different areas of our fishery to achieve any of these measures. So I think this is great. This allows the discussion to happen. I don't know where the industry will fall on the various options, but I think this is the vehicle to move it forward. You guys are most capable of bringing the best information to the table and giving our industries an, a, a really strong voice in you know, trying to map this future and keep our fishery out of jeopardy. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have any more hands in the audience who would like to come up and speak? Seeing none, any more comments from the table? 
Okay, we have a motion. It's been seconded. All comments are over. I guess it's time to vote. I think you need to reread the motion now, David. Do I have to do this? Move to initiate an addendum to reduce the number of vertical lines in the water. The PDT should consider the following as specified in the lobster whale work group memo. The PDT may need to consider the ongoing activities of Altorb uh, when drafting this document. Reductions of vertical lines by 20 to 40 percent for each LCMA, exclusive of Area 6. Percent reduction by LCMA may differ given ongoing and future <laughs> trap reductions as well as newly proposed or implemented area closures in state and federal waters. In LCMA 1, 4, 5 and the outer cape reductions may be achieved by trap limits, gear configurations, season closures or other measures. In LCMA, two and three reductions may be, can be achieved by gear configurations, season closures, acceleration of current planned trap reductions or other measures. Elimination of a 10% replacement uh, tag provision, de uh, developing a method for reporting vertical lines and trap use by individuals in each jurisdiction until 100% re uh, harvest reporting is implemented in state and federal waters. Thank you, David. Um, do we need time to caucus? Okay, all in favor of the motion on the table, raise your right hand, please. I don't think I need to do this, but we'll, we'll do this opposition. Abstention. Null votes. No. 11, no, no, no. A motion passes, and David, did you have a follow up from what you removed? Uh, I defer to Pat Kelleher. I think he was going to make a suggestion. Pat Kelleher. Yeah, my, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do have um, a motion that was prepared. I don't know if it was. Do you want me to do the um, working group report first and follow up with your motion? Yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we do let, Let's do that. So uh, the um, lobster vessel Lobster Enforcement Vessel Working Group, it might be good to do that report out and then come back to this electronic monitoring issue because of the, there is a recommendation that came out of that working group relative to this issue. Okay, thank you, Bob. Now, before we go on to that item, Megan does have a question. Um, I was just going to ask, so this is a pretty hefty document for the PDT, so I'm going to ask that all states review their PDT membership and make sure that the person who is most qualified to work on this is a member of the PDT and that they also have uh, time to write part of this document. Uh, so if states could review that, that would be a big help. Pat Kelleher. Megan, will the PDT be relying on the IEC data and model in doing any of this work? I think that will be one of the first discussions of that group, so I don't have an answer for that. We, we have a technical committee that is fairly well tasked right now in regards to uh, uh, the current assessment work that is ongoing. We've already, and we've already tabled the um, the resiliency addendum, um, and I'm hesitant to put this on the table, but knowing that the individual states, when they have talked to IEC in regards to data sets, have identified some problems, is it worthwhile having the TC take a look at this data to ensure the TC's comfort level Again, knowing full well that they're very well t fully tasked at this moment. 
So I, th I think that's a question for the board. Um, I think you're correct in saying that the TC has is, is got their hands full right now with the assessment. So I just want to say that if we do task the TC with something, there may be delays down the road for the assessment. Um, but that's the board's decision on how you would like to move forward with that. Go ahead, Pat. Um, knowing full well that workload and knowing um, that we might initiate delays, I also would echo some of the environmental com group comments in regards to data and ensuring that we are utilizing the best available data with the work that we're doing. Um, and, and as such, um, um, I, I would move that we task the technical committee uh, to review the IEC data to ensure um, to ensure that we have a, um, a reliable comfort as with its use. Okay, Pat has moved for that. Tony, did you have something on that? Tony Kearns? I just have a question for each of the states to confirm that the technical committee is actually the right group to review that. Um, because in every state, the technical committee person isn't necessarily their data guru. So I think in some air in some states, it might be a different person, and that's why when Megan and I have communicated with the states and IEC, we have asked for them to the state to make sure that they are providing the right contact to IEC, and then each individual state sign off on their data and how IEC is using that data before they allow or um, communicate with NOAA that that data has been approved. And that they also CC Colleen and any, and Colleen is the um, NOAA person working on the whale group for those that don't know, um, to confirm either that Colleen knows that the state has a concern and that then Colleen also knows that that um, concern has been signed off and addressed so that no one knows when concerns are there. Um, I just don't know if the TC is going to have all the right people to do that or not. It's a question to the states. We have a motion on the table, Nan. Uh, it needs to be seconded. Is there a second for Pat's motion? Richie White, you seconded? Discussion on the motion. Now, Dan McKernan. Thanks. To Tony's point, um, the person at MassDMF who's on the TC is different than the person who's our data guru, so um, I don't think we would support this. For some reason, I'm not seeing your last name. I want to pronounce it right because people listening. Jay McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm in agreement uh, with Mr. McKiernan. I, I uh, am opposed to this motion. I think it's incumbent on the states to, you know, have taken a look at this data. The technical committee has a tremendous amount of work to get done with the assessment. I don't think we need to task them. I think there are other ways of um, getting at what you're trying to get at, Pat, that we can do external to the technical committee. Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, what is the IEC data? And uh, secondly, why are we asking the technical co committee to review that data? <laughs> um, so, for the one of the things that has been used in the past for the TRT is uh, a, a model called we, we call it the IEC model. It's the group that makes it, um, and fisheries data that goes into that. Um, it was originally used for a co-occurrence model, so it mapped where fisheries were versus where whales were, um, and that's not really its use at this point. But it uh, is looking like it might be the best available data for things like uh, number of vertical lines or information on gear in different fisheries. Um, and it is the data is collected from all of the Atlantic coast states, so it has a pretty large geographic span. Um, and since this is the data that may be used in the biological opinion, I think there was an interest to make sure that that data really reflects what's actually happening um, and for the states to review it. Does that help, Emerson? Yes, thank you. 
David Borden, and then Doug Grout. Yeah, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just going to suggest a simpler way, rather than deal with the <coughs> excuse me, rather than deal with the motion, simply to ask every state director sitting around the table to uh, go home, talk to the appropriate staff in their agency, have them review this data, and then send have the state director send a. Uh, email uh, into our staff basically saying that they either approve or disapprove, and if they disapprove, then contact, uh, follow the directions that Tony specified. Thank you, David. Doug, and then Dennis Abbott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the person that deals with our landings data is different than our technical committee member, and we have been already at the instruction of, of the commission staff uh, reviewing the IEC data uh, compared to our state, which actually has N-line numbers. We've been requiring that number in our lobster reporting for a number of years, and um, at least from our particular uh, small state, the numbers are very different than what's in the IEC model. So we are planning to, uh, this is something that I thought was already a task that the states were undertaking. Uh, but if we want to send a formal response to the commission staff about this, we can do that. But I, I don't, at least from my standpoint, the technical committee wouldn't be the most appropriate uh, um, entity to look at this. Thank you, Doug. Dennis has deferred. Pat Kelleher. Uh, I appreciate those comments, and that's why I, I, I was hesitant to make the motion in the first place, because I, uh, more because of the workload, but I think the points on um, are they the right entity to review, I certainly uh, I, I take to heart. I, but like Doug, um, when our staff looked at the IEC data in regards to Maine, we had um, a lot of concerns, and IEC was very quick to help address those. If, in fact, all jurisdictions are moving forward and, uh, and having those conversations, that I'm comfortable because the PDT is not, as, as Tony just reminded me, PDT is not going to utilize data sets that, uh, that are not going to be accurate. So if, if, the, if jurisdictions sitting around this table are comfortable um, that, and they're interacting with IEC with their data sets, then, then I'm much more comfortable. But um, if they're not, then I remain concerned that uh, the data that's going to drive the biological opinion and the data that would help would also be used to drive any development of any addendum uh, is potentially going to be flawed. And I want to ensure that that's not the case. Okay, thank you, Pat. Peter Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think this is a good discussion, and I think it's really important. Certainly the fishery service believes that we have to use the best data and that it's important for everyone to be on the same page with what we, what we begin with and what we use. And so I think IEC um, could be available to do a webinar or some type of a seminar to go through uh, the data that they have, and we could have the appropriate people um, sit in on the webinar from the different states, and then there could be some interaction between them and how the, you know, the caveats on the data and what, you know, where the gaps are and where the, where the questions are. So that might be a good way to really get everybody all together and, and uh, kind of uh, take a look at the information there and, and make any corrections as needed. Thank you, Peter. One more time, Pat Kelleher. I, I, I appreciate that, Peter. I think that is a fantastic suggestion. Um, it allows us uh, to have the right people uh, interact with them, ensure that that conversation happens. And with that in mind, um, if uh, the, the seconder of the motion agrees, I would uh, be happy to withdraw. Doug, that was you, I believe. Oh, no, it was Agreed. you, Richie. I'm sorry. Agree. Okay, that motion is withdrawn. Dan McKernan. The elephant in the room on all of this um, forward management of the lobster fishery is the role of the exempted areas and to what degree the exempted areas will continue to be exempted. And I only bring this up because one of my best staff is going to be saddled with serving on this PDT, and he's going to ask me Friday morning, that question and 
I, I don't know how we come away from this meeting without sending that signal to the PDT. Maine has the exemption, the historic exemption line that encompasses a lot of their state waters. New Hampshire exemption lines includes all of you know the Great Bay. Massachusetts has a zero to three mile uh, exemption for single traps. The Nantucket Sound fishery at this point is not included because of the, the lack of whale sightings down there. So we. I hope that we can send a, a signal to them, or uh, I don't know if, if, if they're listening in, but I, I'm really concerned that there's no message being sent there. And that's going to be a huge issue t for NIMS when they do their biological opinion. So I know we're, we're hoping the PDT delivers the goods, you know, a definitive, uh, verifiable management scheme, but that's a big question. And I, don't, I didn't see that, um, that noted in the motion, and I hate to bring it up after the motion, but I'd like to have a discussion on that. I'm looking around, Dan, to see if somebody would like to discuss it. Anybody want to talk? No? I guess not today. OK, we are going to move to item number Five, report from the Lobster Enforcement Vessel Working Group, Bob Beal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make this uh, fairly brief, but uh, happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, I don't have slides, but there is the um, draft meeting summary and the supplemental material that was supplied to the board. Um, this board has talked about offshore lobster enforcement a number of times and, and expressed concerns over the difficulty of um, enforcing the, the regulations out in the offshore areas, um, the different gear, far from shore, um, heavy gear, those sorts of things. So, um, and there's also been some discussions uh, with NOAA Fisheries about ways that we could po possibly build a vessel, fund a vessel uh, that's capable of going offshore, hauling gear, and enforcing the provisions in the, in the offshore area. So. Um, NOAA Fisheries has identified some opportunities possibly for funding a vessel and building a vessel. Um, and with the hopes that that actually is able to move forward, uh, this board formed a working group to talk about the offshore area and how, um, how we would staff an enforcement vessel and what the, where the vessel would be located, who would own the vessel, um, all the other logistics associated with, with the vessel uh, operating in the offshore area. So this. Um, that group was formed at the annual meeting. The group got together December 20th um, this year, uh, right before the Christmas holidays. The, the current makeup of the group has representatives from Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, um, NOAA Office of Law Enforcement, and the U.S. Coast Guard. If any other states want to be involved, they're, they're more than welcome to become part of the working group. Um, the, the meeting started out with kind of a, a background conversation about um, offshore enforcement and the difficulties associated with it and the limitations of the current vessels that the states operate and um, you know there was a note that the US Coast Guard doesn't pull lobster gear they don't have the ability to, to haul gear and look at it um, and, the, and the reality is most of enforcement in lobster gear right now is limited to about 20 25 miles offshore there are some trips that go farther than that but they're they're not very common um, you know, there was some conversation about some examples of when the enforcement vessels do uh, wander farther offshore to, to enforce the provisions. There's some a pretty high non-compliance rate, up to 80 percent in some areas on one trip that was made. Uh, the, the enforcement folks knew of some folks that weren't playing by the rules. So they went out to those areas and they found a lot of illegal gear, and uh, so you know that just just reinforced the concern of the of the of the group that there needed to be increased offshore lobster uh, enforcement. The first subject that the group talked about gets to this electronic monitoring conversation that the board had earlier today. And um, the, the, the group quickly came to the point where just building a new shiny vessel and saying, go offshore and enforce lobster rules really doesn't work uh, all by itself. That, the, um, that vessel and the, and the enforcement folks would need to be able to narrow down the, the part of the ocean that they're going to travel in and, and enforce the regulations in. So step one, the group agreed, would be uh, electronic monitoring, VMS-type monitoring on all the federally permitted vessels to be able to identify, obviously, where, where the vessels are going. But it would be a little bit more complex than just standard VMS. It would be um, gear or, or monitoring gear that is, any time the hydraulics or the winch are um, engaged, the you know there would be a ping sent back to shore or recorded the vessel location and the fact that the hydraulics have been engaged and they're hauling gear offshore so they know 
when that vessel is hauling gear and where they're located and and you know anytime so that once once you get build a record of this the offshore vessel would know where to go and where to look at gear and where to haul gear and, and make sure it's all compliant with the, uh, the the current provision so there is a recommendation that came out of the group that um i think pat's gonna talk to a little bit later but the bottom line is that um, you know the, the group recommends an accelerated approach to implementing a VMS type system in all um, offshore area or all federally permitted vessels fishing in the offshore areas um, you know and this would as I said would be more complex than just you know some of the VMS systems just monitor vessel location every half an hour fairly infrequently so it would be linked to uh, the hydraulics and, and a frequent ping rate so they have a, a good uh, you know, track of where that vessel is going and where that vessel is fishing. Um, the other provision there is this: uh, um, this technology could be linked to cameras, so that any time the, the uh, trap hauler is engaged, that camera would uh, start recording all the activity on the deck, and they could uh, count traps and, and uh, you know monitor the other parts of the fishery as well. So um, that that is a recommendation that is to this management board for consideration uh, during this meeting. Um, the group talked a lot, obviously, about, you know, what would this offshore vessel look like? How big is it? How, what's the capacity? How long would it need to be able to stay offshore? And those type of details. And they really, after a fair amount of discussion, they came up with two scenarios. The first scenario is a 70-ish foot steel hulled vessel um, that could operate offshore for, you know, fairly long periods of time, haul a lot of gear, look at a lot of areas, and it would be, you know, fairly independent offshore and it could operate on its own without support of the Coast Guard or anyone else. Um, but as that question, or as that conversation kind of matured during this meeting, it came clear that this vessel would probably need to be owned by the federal government, either the U.S. Coast Guard or NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. So. Given the complexities of, of adding another vessel to the federal fleet, they came up with option B as well, which would be a vessel in the mid 50 foot range, 55 foot, but it would be a fiberglass vessel, a little bit less expensive to build, a little bit less endurance offshore, and a little bit more restricted by, by weather. Uh, but the U.S. Coast Guard representative said they'd be willing to partner with this vessel and do offshore enforcement. Um, the, one of the ideas is this, that boat would be owned by the state of Maine. Maine would uh, insure the boat, self-insure the boat, and uh, be staffed primarily by Maine enforcement folks, but it would be also available to travel south down to some of the other more southern offshore areas and, and um, engage in enforcement activities uh, in those areas as well. So those sort of option A and option B need to be fleshed out a little bit better. One of the other areas that was talked about uh, toward the end of the meeting was the, the schedule and the penalties for violations. What the, the number of the states are doing is much faster and much more severe than what happens sometimes in the federal system. Uh, the federal system is, is, is you know, it does take a long time and multiple years to um, fully prosecute a, a case that is made and state systems take you know two months, four months, six months, something along those lines. So there's a, a disconnect there and, and states frequently uh, suspend or revoke fishing permits and the federal government doesn't do that uh, very frequently uh, so you know there there's a uh, conversation that we should have some more discussion about making the the federal and state penalties more consistent and try to streamline i don't know if we can fe necessarily speed up the federal enforcement process but at least um, you know have that conversation and decide if we could make the the penalties and some of the processes more consistent between state and federal government so uh, Mr. Chairman, that's a quick summary. There's some, a number of follow-up follow -up activities at the end of the, the meeting summary, but all in all, I think it, it's a good group. They, they clearly understand all the ins and outs of this. They've, they've moved forward quite a bit on how to staff this vessel and own this vessel and, and operate this vessel, but there are details still to, 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 uh, that need to be fleshed out some more. Uh, but the primary short-term outcome is this notion of electronic monitoring of the federally permitted vessels and, and that working group made that recommendation to this board for consideration today so happy to answer any questions and there's a number of folks obviously around the table that are part of that working group and can chime in if they want to provide more details thank you Bob questions or comments David Borden thank Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick comment. When, when we talk about tracking, we're not talking about VMS. We're talking about a tracking system that's probably about the size of your cell phone uh, that would record uh, every five minutes. And um, therefore, you'd have an actual location where the gear is being hauled as opposed to a VMS system and the big difference, one of the big differences, cost, uh, 
tracking system is about a $350 item, and then you get a service program that goes with it. Um, a VMS system can cost thousands of dollars. And the biggest, one of the biggest issues is the electrical draw on the boat. A lot of the fleet that would be covered by this are on moorings, don't have access to electrical outlets, so you've got to get something with a, a low draw. So, um, uh, otherwise, they simply burn out the batteries. Thank you, David. Pat Kelleher. Yeah, I, I, I can't um, emphasize more the importance of uh, being able to haul gear um, in Area 3 uh, from an enforcement perspective. Um, the goal in the state of Maine is voluntary compliance. That's, that is the end goal with everything that we put in place. And we maintain voluntary compliance in two different ways. Um, one, the, the fleet knows that the Maine Marine Patrol is hauling lobster gear up and down the coast, 20 to 30,000 traps a year. I mean, it's a small percentage of what, what, what you, Mr. Chairman, as a fisherman would haul yourself. But the fact that we're hauling gear, confiscating gear, and writing tickets based on that uh, ensures, um, ensures voluntary compliance. Um, we've just received um, not too long ago some um, intel in regards to a, a fisherman in Area 3. Um, and after going out and, um, and hauling that individual's gear, um, we discovered that 80% of that gear was in violation, 80%. Um, hauling some other gear in the area, we ended up ticketing another person for uh, having untagged gear. So that's just a, that's just a snapshot. And I don't mean to say that 80% of the gear in Area 3 is non-compliant. This was obviously based on, based on good intelligence for the time. Um, but if we're not hauling gear we, and didn't have the ability to haul gear, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have found it. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have found those violations. So it's something that this board needs to con uh, keep in mind. I, I think we need to find a way to get a big boat into the fleet. Um, I, 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 am, I am willing to um, redirect some of the assets within the state of Maine to try to do this, even though we have the fewest amount of permit holders in Area 3. This is one lobster management unit. Now, we, we are managing the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's Bank, um, so it is a resource issue as well as uh, a compliance issue with our FMPs and an issue for marine mammals. So we need to, we need to fi find a way to solve this problem. Um, and the, the electronic monitoring is a big part of this, and frankly, it's the first step that needs to be taken. And with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion um, in the queue ready to go up to start a discussion on that component. Well, let's get the motion up. My, my, not, my motion is not a Dr. Pierce motion, and that is not it either, I don't think, is it? Unless you... Yes, it is. No, it's not. No, there it is. God. No, that's not it. That's definitely not it. <laughs> no, I'm not postponing. You don't have it. You didn't get it. Uh, I, 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 it's short. I, I'll, I'll read it and you, and you type. How's that? You ready? Okay. Move that the lobster board recommend to the policy board that a letter be sent to NOAA Fisheries for consideration by the TRT to develop and support a suite of options for electronic vessel monitoring for federally permitted vessels. And if I get a second, I'll... Seconded by Dennis Abbott. So Go ahead, Pat. I, I, I want to reiterate some points that David Borden met, th made, and I didn't feel like I needed to put it in a motion, um, but this we're not talking about VMS here. We're, we're talking about 
a very simple system that has been tried and true, that tried and tested uh, on offshore vessels that um, uh, would you could create geofencing with it. You could, you can ensure um, that we know that when they leave the dock. Um, but, but based on Bluetooth technology, you'd know when the hauler is engaged, so you'd know where the gear is. Um, and that's very, very important to have that information as it relates to a large offshore vessel because it, it, the, the density of gear in Area Three is nothing like we have in inside. Um, so having an, that knowledge of where that gear is to then haul is critical. And I think beyond that, uh, the idea of video, as, as, uh, as our executive director said, the idea of potential uh, video use within this type of system is also very important. Thank you, Pat. Nanis is a seconder. Would you like to speak? No? Okay. Eric Reed. no? Go ahead, Dan McKernan. Pat, could you explain the role of the large whale take reduction team um, as the recipient of this? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I, as I said earlier, I, and, and maybe I shouldn't make such a hard black and white line here, but to me this, this type of technology really gets to serious injury and mortality. It's a way for us to monitor gear um, as it relates to, uh, you know, current and future regulations, rope size, diameters, traps, number of traps on a trawl, um, information uh, in regards to um, issues that, again, relate to not necessarily as much risk, but as, as it does to serious injury and mortality. And I think that belongs in their wheelhouse. Doesn't mean we can't assist. I think we're, we all have representatives on the TRT that can help with that, uh, as well as the commission's representative on the TRT. Peter Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that um, if the if the policy board decides or the board approves this and the policy board sends a letter, I think it would be good and helpful to have as much technical information in there as, as possible to to provide um, provide the TRT with some uh, different types of of uh, technologies and the type that, that the board might be looking for uh, to look at so that it can sort of uh, give a little bit more detail on the scope and, and the intent of, of what's happening here. And if there's any information either from a working group or from the Law Enforcement Committee that can help inform that, I think that information would be, um, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Dennis Abbott. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Having been at that meeting, it seemed very clear that if you didn't have this, there would really not be a lot of sense in having an offshore vessel because Maine law enforcement at that meeting talked about the difficulty in even locating any gear. And you could spend inordinate amounts of time looking for gear and not, not find it, finding it. So these two things, getting a craft and having this monitoring, goes hand in hand and they both have to be there. Thank you, Dennis. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, not knowing the, the membership and expertise of all the individuals on the TRT right off the top of my head, I, you know, I, I, I take Peter's point that, you know, the, the TRT may not have all the expertise they need to dig into all the options and different um, hardware and software and other things that are available to monitor vessels and cameras and all the other you know there's a there's electronic monitoring experts out there so we'll try to do the best we can in providing them some information um, in that letter or you know working with our law enforcement committee or something else to, to help that group out and, and at least understand what the goals of what we're trying to achieve through this electronic monitoring so that you know it's a fair point there there are individuals that weren't put together to be electronic monitoring experts Thank you, Bob. Any other comments on the motion? Do we need time to caucus? Okay, everyone in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Opposed? Null votes? Abstentions? The one was a statue. 
Motion carries 10 zero, zero, 001. Ray Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've just heard Dennis's uh, rationale. I know years ago, offshore lobster for Bobby Brown. Uh, has anybody contemplated aerial surveys to find illegal gear? I mean, it's a lot quicker way than it's just a thought. You know, put a plane up, go offshore, and uh, you'll have tracking on legal gear. You'll know where that is. But the illegal gear, so you can send the enforcement boat directly to the illegal gear. Just a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Pat Kelleher? Yeah, I, I was just I, I'm glad you finished that because, I mean, the Maine Marine Patrol has a plane. I can tell you we haven't written any violations, lobster violations with it. But if you, if you had that sort of um, uh, ability, that would be great. However, we're flying a Cessna on floats. So to go that far out, um, I can tell you, um, or, and the major could tell you better, that our pilot would not be thrilled about being sent 75 or 80 miles offshore, even with float. So you'd have to have, um, you know, you'd have to have a, a, an aircraft with a little bit longer range, I think, to do that type of work. So it might be even more cost prohibitive. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, just a thank you. Uh, another suggestion, uh, bluefin tuna observer pilots. You know, you can pick them up cheap. Uh, they're no longer observing for uh, saners, and they fly that distance, single engines, without floats. Thank you, Ray. Okay, we're going to go on to our next agenda item. Review implementation of the Jonah Crab Fishery Management Plan for Delaware and New York, and I'll take it in the way that it is presented. Delaware, do you have anything to tell me? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do indeed. I apologize for the first day's tardiness in uh, getting into compliance here, but we have started the regulatory process. Uh, the first step has been completed, and within four to six months, we should be in full compliance for our little harvest of Jonah Crab Claws. Thank you. That was John Clark, by the way. Thank you very much. And New York? I'll start by apologizing, too, just because John said this there. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, <clears throat> just let me give you a, a little bit more complicated, just, but it's, um, I think we put it in context. So um, we have a rulemaking in place, um, so we're, we're ready with all the limits to file them. Uh, unfortunately, the statute that um, we have for this expired on December 31st. So currently, I have a rulemaking that I can't file. However, the legislature, both the Assembly and the Senate, have put bills in to uh, restore that statute. So the minute I have that, um, we'll be able to file the rules, which should be pretty soon, not even, I mean, we're, hopefully we're looking at by March. Um, and we're working with the legislature. They know that this is, a, we're, you know, out of compliance right now, so they understand the priority of it. Um, the one hiccup we have is, um, just to give you some stats, is that, well, first off, like most states, this is a federal fishery for the most part, and the FMP requires that you, uh, essentially have a lobster license to prosecute this fishery. In New York, we have a total of 12 permit holders in 2018. Um, Ten of them have lobster licenses, so um, we're there, they're fine. The one issue we got is that in New York, you can also harvest if you have a crab permit. There are two um, uh, individuals, and I think they're related, um, that have crab permits that fish in state waters but don't have a lobster license. So um, if I either, if we cannot figure out a way to accommodate these guys, these guys will be out of the fishery, and I've actually met this guy, and he's actually pretty reasonable. Um, so we've got two options on that. I can try to convince the legislature to do additional legislation for two fishermen that are gotten caught up in this little um, technicality, for lack of a better term, or is there some way 
through um, the board we could do a technical fix for this for these two guys that are they're essentially caught in the what came from the FMP so that's the sticking point I have two fishermen that I'm not sure how we cover in this and that's assuming we do all of you know everything else should be going forward in terms of implementing the management um, requirements but I have two that I'm trying to keep in the fishery that have been doing this for a long time so that's where we are Mr. Chairman Thank you, Jim. My question is if you follow through with everything else in the legislative process, you st if you don't get something resolved through the legislature for these two, you'll have something back here at our next meeting or the following meeting for us to resolve it? Yeah, well, we're looking at the other thing is the legislature, um, the whole thing changed over the last election, so a lot of new people trying to get up to speed on this. So <laughs> we're hoping to solve this through the legislature, but that would probably be where we would get to, that if we cannot fix it um, in New York, we would come back to the board in uh, the May meeting and try to you know come up with some other solution for the two fishermen. Thank you, Jim. Is there any other discussion on this topic? Uh, this is a possible action item. I don't see a need for action at this time. So if without a motion as such, I think we move on. Progress update in the 2020 American Lobster Benchmark Stock Assessment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the Lobster Stock Assessment Subcommittee actually met last week at our second in-person meeting. It was an assessment workshop in New Bedford, Massachusetts uh, from Monday to Thursday. We reviewed the uh, assessment models, the length-based assessment models with data updated through 2017 and also covered our non-model dependent terms of reference at that workshop. Uh, just as a reminder, the big milestones moving forward, we'll have our last uh, in-person workshop with the Stock Assessment Subcommittee uh, tentatively scheduled for September of this year. Uh, at that meeting, we'll be reviewing uh, what we hope will be our final base models for this, uh, this current assessment. Uh, tentatively, we are scheduled for a peer review in May of 2020, and then we'll be coming to this board to present the results of the assessment and that peer review uh, at the August ASMFC meeting in 2020. So if there are any questions on the assessment progress, I can take those now. Do we have any questions for Jeff? You nailed it, I guess. David Warden. And not, not a question, but I had the good fortune of sitting through a day and a half of the discussions, and I just compliment Jeff. I thought he ran a good, a good meeting. I thought the the committee was very focused and uh, challenging of each other. When someone makes a statement, they're they're right after each other, and that's what we need to get a good product out of it in the end. So keep up the good work. Okay, do we have any other business? Do we have, <laughs> go ahead, Pat Kelleher. I'm gonna bring it back to, uh, to Wales one last time. We, we have spent a lot of time uh, as a body just speaking about um, the interactions and risks associated with lobster fisheries in right whales, but we are not having any conversation about every other fishery from Maine to Florida. And um, I, I am, I'm not asking uh, for any specific information from NOAA Fisheries, but um, you, you know there is other risk out there besides the lobster fishery, and I don't want. Uh, I know NOAA not, has not lost sight of that issue, but I just want to make sure that that's on the record for uh, to express the state of Maine's concerns that other other work needs to be done here besides what's being done with this management board. Anybody else? Seeing nothing, I'll entertain a final motion. Peter Burns. Peter Burns. 
Just to follow up on Mr. Keller's uh, comment, I think that um, in the process of the IEC webinar, maybe we could address that issue because I believe that when that data was initially put together, that was to look at the co-occurrence model of where fixed gear fisheries and whales were interacting. And so there may be some of that data that's still available there and, and um, something we could um, take advantage of that opportunity at that time possibly. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Would you like to follow that up with a final motion? Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Any opposition? We're all done.